Take two. One of these days, I'm just going to, uh, you know, lip sync, talk like that, and see, see, drive folks crazy. Anyhow, uh, as I was saying, now we can, now with CSS, we can focus on on the style. In, in the past, we were focusing on the content and the logical structure of the page and tagging things so that uh, the tags would indicate what um, the content meant. Now we're interested in the appearance. And one example I gave is, is I had students on, on one of the assignments, for example, use H2s without using H1s. All right? And I asked them, like, well, how come you have H2s and you don't have H1s? And the statement was, it's like, well, I thought the H1s were too big, and therefore I wanted to make um, the H2s to make it the proper size, the size that I wanted. And I can appreciate that thought. I mean, you want to do your best to make the page look the way that you envision it. However, strictly speaking, that's not the best way to handle it. The best way to handle it is uh, a tag is what it is. If it's a top-level heading, it's an H1. If you don't like the size of it, you use CSS rules to change the size and make it look different. All right. Um, likewise, you know, you see any number of different things like that. Um, you know. Uh, you know, I skipped from a, I went, I had an H1 and I had an H3. Why? Well, the H2s weren't the right, you know, and all that. Tags are what they are. They're, they're to represent the meaning of that content and the CSS we're going to use to change it. So we went over last time and let's take a quick look at what we did and then we'll build upon it uh, today. What we did last time was, took this page and applied some CSS to it. Now we didn't do tons of stuff, but we did a few things. We actually put our CSS in a separate file. The chief advantage of that is that um, you can then use that file in other pages. One of your goals in creating a website is that you have some consistency in how your page looks. Consistency is good in websites. Um, and by isolating and putting the CSS in a separate file, you can help ensure that uh, consistency. Because I can use that CSS file on, on one page, and then I can use the same CSS file on another page. So both of them point to the same CSS file. They both have these link tags which link this page to that CSS. And therefore, if I make a change to the CSS, that change gets reflected um, in both files. So I'll keep it separate. All right, Keep those two things separate so that I can address them separately. All right. Let's look at what our CSS file looks like then. All right. CSS is a, uh, a listing or is a set of what I call CSS rules. All right. Each rule has two parts. And this should largely be review, but I think it, 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 it uh, bears repeating. The two parts of a rule are the selector, which is the first part, the part prior to the curly brackets here, the braces. And then within the braces, there's a set of attribute names and values. Attributes, just like we talked about before, the, the, the href attribute, you know, attributes are characteristics of the page. And therefore, we can set those characteristics. And the way we do it is we have the name of the characteristic, a colon, the value we want for that characteristic, and then a semicolon. Then we have the next name of the attribute, colon, value of the attribute, semicolon, name of attribute, colon, value, 
semicolon. All right. So then we end that style rule, and then we start the next style rule. So in this case, I said it's a specific style for the body. That's everything on the page. I set a style rule for the header. I set the style rule for H1s, H2s, and H3s, and so on. Now, style sheets cascade. That is what the C means in cascading style sheets, CSS, cascading style sheets, which means that more than one rule can apply to any given thing on a page. So in other words, this, ta this, this rule here says I'm going to paint everything in the body with a text color of gray and a background of white. And then this comes along and says, well, no, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to paint everything in the header section with a background of gray and a color of yellow. And then this comes along and says, no, I'm going to paint everything in the H1 with a background of blue. All right. Now, if we look at this header, if we look at this tag here, this H1, it actually gets some of the rule from the H1, the background of blue, the font family, but it gets the text color from header. The more specific uh, the rule is, the sort of closer the rule is to the actual tag and the content, the, 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 pre the more precedence it takes. So for example, H1 rule, this is an H1 tag. So yeah, it's going to get the rules for H1. Anything that H1 doesn't define, no can be defined by the header. Anything that's not defined by H1 or the header can be defined from this. So you'll see this all the time where one thing on the page gets its appearance from a combination of other things. And then sort of the last thing in the equation is that the browser also has some default behavior. So for example, if we didn't set the size of this H1, which we didn't, all right, um, the browser makes it as big as it thinks H1 should be. All right. Any questions about this? So, what is learning CSS about? Learning HTML is about learning what the proper tags are and what the attributes for those tags are and how to use the tags. CSS is about learning all the different ways we can use our selector. All right. Because this is just one way, one style, one, one, I shouldn't use the word style, one kind of selector where we have a selector that corresponds to an HTML tag where we say every HTML tag on the page of this type gets the style rule. There's other kinds of selectors as well. And, and we'll go over them, maybe some today. If not, then definitely some next week. All right. So that's one thing. We're going to refine our selectors and we're going we're gonna to be able to not make everything on the page of a certain tag, but maybe make just a couple of things. A couple of things that we want to give some special emphasis to. All right. The other thing we're going to learn about is we're going to learn about all the different attributes that we can set. All right. So in this case, we've set, we, we've played with uh, really three attributes. The text color, the background color, and the font family. What else can you set? There's countless other things that you can set. You can set the width of things. You can set the height of things. You can set the position of things. All right. Um, you can set the size of the font. You can set the border around something. You can set the space between the letters. You can set the space between two different things on your page. You can set a border. You know, just about anything you can imagine that deals with the appearance you can control. The space between lines in a paragraph, you know, um, just about anything you can think of we can control. Well, so it's going to take a while for us to, to learn. Um, I won't even say to learn all of them because we're not going to learn all of them. But we'll learn enough of them where you're, you'll be able to do some fundamental things and you'll then have the tools to be able to go and look up something if, if, you, if we haven't talked about how to do that. Like maybe we haven't talked about how to make the text a bigger size, 
for example. Well, you kind of get the idea of how this works. You can look it up and you can see how to do that. So, yes? Are there any uh, global CSS formats, especially for mobile uh, web pages, or do you have to that kind of individually? Okay, the question was about mobile web pages. That's a whole topic in itself, all right? There's a number of approaches that can be taken as far as mobile devices go. You can, you can, in some cases, write one style sheet that, depending on the size of the screen, will display it different ways, display the same content in different ways. So it will look good on a desktop browser, and it'll look good on a mobile device. You can also write stuff so that if it's a desktop de uh, device, I'm going to apply this style sheet to it. If it's a mobile device, I'm going to apply this other style sheet to it. So that's sort of the second approach. And then the third approach is, is, is like, this is too much hassle. I'm just going to make two different sites. I'm going to make a mobile site and I'm going to make a desktop site. Uh, now they all have their advantages and disadvantages, to be sure. Um, In a nutshell, it can be very difficult to write a one-size-fits-all style sheet. If you can imagine the difference in screens, you know, the difference in screen sizes is, is crazy, right? From a little phone that's so big, you know, to some of them big monitors that are this big. So to create a web page that looks good in both of those with one style sheet, that's going to be tough, all right? Not to say you can't do a pretty good job with it, but it can be tough. Um, Writing code that applies one style sheet in one case and one style sheet in another case is sometimes a pretty good idea. And you can get that to work and you can, you can then tweak the mobile to look good for mobile and tweak the desktop to look good for a desktop. Um, but you're still taking one page and trying to stretch it and push it and gouge it into shape for two radically different environments. So sometimes people throw their arms up and say, I'll oh, just have two different mobile, two different sites, one for mobile, one for that. That way, hey, I can make the mobile one look really good for mobile. I can make the desktop look really good for that. And I'm not worried about like taking one and trying to like push it into, uh, uh, you know, into accommodating both environments. Now, which approach you take depends on a lot of things. It depends, first of all, on your content, all right? Um, Typically, the sites that go for two different sites um, have a lot of content and have some things that you might want to see if you're browsing from a desktop and then different things if you want to see if you're browsing by mobile. All right. For example, uh, LC's site. LC has a different mobile site than they have a desktop site. Why? Well, because chances are if you're browsing to LC's site on a mobile phone, there's maybe just like a handful of things you want to do. Maybe you want to look up someone's phone number because you want to call and, and say you're going to be late for an exam. Or, or maybe you want to see if the uh, classes are canceled because of snow or, or whatever. All right. Whereas if you're at your desktop working on it, you know, there's probably a lot more stuff that you're going to want to do. Maybe plan out your schedule and see what courses are required for a degree and so on and so forth. So when you have really a lot of content and you have two groups of people with really different goals, then you go for the two uh, um, sites. The site, the one size fit all CSS, Maybe if it's a smaller site with smaller content, you could write one CSS that looks good in both. And we'll talk about sort of flexible CSS versus rigid CSS uh, coming up. And then the last, the middle ground of like having one page but applying different style sheets, that's sort of between the two extremes where you don't have a tiny bit of content but you have a pretty good amount of content but you don't have a massive amount of content. You can tell I'm excited about this, all right? Because uh, we're, we recently introduced a couple new classes, and one of them is a mobile web development class. Um, and so that, that's a good class uh, to consider taking uh, in future semesters. We actually just got our degree program approved by the Ohio Board of Regents. So we're pretty excited about that. And this is the first semester I'm teaching some of those classes. So um, that is probably a, a longer answer than, than, than you had expected. but. 
it's not as long as I probably could make it, <laughs> all right? Because that's really what we talk about uh, in detail in, in uh, the mobile development class. Now, bringing this back to relevance to this class, all this stuff starts, all these good things that I'm talking about, being able to do this, that, and the other, starts with having a good separation between your HTML and CSS. If you do that, then you're in a position to be able to apply different style sheets and so on. All right, great question. So, learning CSS then, what does it consist of? Well, learning more about what the selectors are, learning more attributes that we can set, and learning what the possible values are. Because, you know, I didn't make up the word color. That's one of the predefined attributes so I can change. I didn't make up the word gray. All right. I can't just put anything in there. I can't put and say, well, I want it to be kind of a lightish gray that almost looks like silk. You know, you can't do that. You have to follow some basic rules as far as the names of the attributes that you put in. All right. So let's talk first about color and how we can express color. We can express colors a couple different ways, all right, or several different ways actually. We'll focus on, we'll focus for now on two of them, and then we'll, we'll expand this to, to other things uh, going forward. The first way to do it is via the name of the color. However, there's a lot of colors that have names, but you know you have to know exactly the name. Of, of it and you have to know what to put in and so it's not necessarily that every color you can think of is there's going to be an HTML color for it so what you can do is if you go in Google and I think there's one of these in Angel oh the one in Angel's broke shoot you can go and say HTML color names. And you can see a chart of the color names. For example, this is Alice Blue, Antique White, Aqua, Aquamarine, and so on down the line. So you see there's a lot of them. But not necessarily every single one that you can think of. So that's one way that you can express the names of the color. All right. Another way is through what are called hex codes. Hex being short for the word hexadecimal. Hexadecimal, um, to define it, means uh, a number system with a base 16. All right. Uh, in other words, what's our normal number system? Our normal number system is a decimal system, all right, where it's base 10, you know, probably because, you know, 10 fingers, all right, people have when they first start counting. Probably as good a reason as any, right? People had eight fingers on each hand, and then we probably would have did hexadecimal from the start and not wait till computers, all right? But hexadecimal is where the numbers go. You know, in, in regular decimal, the numbers go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Then 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, through 1, 9. Then 2, 0. Well, hexadecimal is the same, except instead of being 10 digits, there are 16 digits. Now, where do you get the extra numbers? You use the letter A for those. Uh, letters A through F for those. So, for example, um, the dead digits in decimal go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. In hexadecimal, you have the extra A, B, C, D, E, and F. All right? And this is not work. Oh, it's working over there. I see. Every day is an adventure about like what's gonna go on what here. I you know. That's the on screen over there. That is okay. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. All right. 
So in other words, the numbers in, in hexadecimal go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. The next number then is 1, 0. 1, 1, 1, 2, blah, 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 1, F. Then 2, 0, 2, F. All the way through F, 0, F, F. If you're a little unsure about like the numbers and, and exactly what they mean, the basic idea is 0 through 9 are the same and then A, B, C, D, E, and F are like all bigger than 0 through 9. All right, F's the biggest of them all going down uh, to A and then A is bigger than 9 going down through 0. All right. So every color, in addition to, uh, every color can be expressed using what are called hexadecimal codes. And you can see the codes right here. All right. For example, dark gray is A9, A9, A9. All right. Dark green is 0, 0, 6, 4, 0, 0. All right. Now, the good news is, is you can use this chart without having a clue how it works just by cutting and pasting. So, you know, we're going to try to do better than that. I'm going to try to, to make you understand or, or, or help you understand uh, a little more detail about this. But the good news is if you don't understand anything I say, all right, you could go here and copy this color of dark turquoise and put it in your CSS file. Put that hex code in there and save it. And you get that color um, for the things that are supposed to get that color. All right, so if you don't understand anything I say, just know that you can do that. Now, for those of you that want to understand it, these hex codes, uh, codes um, are created by blending three colors together. And those of you that maybe, you know, have studied art or studied physics know that there's two ways that you can co uh, uh, combine things. Like there's, there's the rules for combining paint, all right? But then there's also the rules for combining light. And they're, they're a little bit different, right? Uh, this deals with combining light, all right? In fact, if any of you remember the old, I guess they're not that old, uh, but, uh, but like projection TVs, like those big old projection TVs that had that, you'd notice that there were three colors coming out of it. There was red, green, and blue. And you could get any color by simply the right mix of red, green, and blue, all right? And that's the basis for these hex codes as well, all right? There is red, green, and blue. The pound sign simply indicates we're using the hex code instead of the name. All right, that way there won't be any confusion on the browser's part. Now, the first two digits of a hex code relate to how much red is in it. The next two relate to how much green is in it. The final pair relate to how much blue is in it. So think of this as having three lights, a red, a green, and a blue, all shined on the same spot. And you can turn each one of those up individually. All right? So, zero means that they're all off. If they're all off, what do you have? You have black. It's dark. There's no lights on. Conversely, if they're all on, and again, remember in the hexadecimal numbering system, that's the biggest number we can get with two digits, FF. Just like in the decimal number system, the highest number we can get with two digits is 99. All right. So FF is the highest. That would be all three lights, red, green, and blue, turned up full blast. And that would be white. All right. So, we can then, from there, we can mix and match. So, if I were to say FF00, 
zero, zero, what color would that be? It would be red. All right. How would that color compare to this color? FF000, zero, 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 how would that compare to 9900? Zero, zero, zero? Which would be lighter? 99 nine would actually be darker. Th think of what you're doing. Okay, yeah, this yeah. number, right, is less than this number. So actually, 99, nine, we're turning down the red a little bit. So there's not going to be as much red, so it's going to be darker. All right? If we did something like this, 1100, zero, 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 that would be red that almost was hard to tell it was red. It would be a very like dark red. It would almost look like it's just like a black with just like a reddish, you know, a little bit of reddish cast to it. Now what would this be? It'd be gray, all right? Because it's not black, because black would be everything turned all the way off, all right? This is everything turned on, but not turned on particularly high. So this would actually be a gray, but it would be sort of a darkish gray. Compared to this, which would be a lightish gray. Because all of them are even, but they're all even at a higher level of intensity, so it's going to be lighter. All right? What would this be? be purple because we have red full blast, we have no green, and we have blue full blast. If we did this, how would this color compare to this color? All right, it'd be darker it'd be and it would be a little more red. All right, so in other words, this would be purple purple, all right, this would be maybe a reddish shade of purple, all right? So, if we look at this color, uh, these color names, we can sort of make sense of some of these things. And again, it's not always obvious how to mix them, but again, this is science and it works. So, for example, if we look at this crimson, all right, it's DC143C. All right, which means that it has, this crimson has a lot of red in it, right? DC is a high number. 1,4 is a pretty low number, so there's a little green in there, believe it or not. And 3C is also kind of a low number. So there's a lot of red, a tiny bit of green, and a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of blue. The cyan is, is, is a blue-green, all right? So there's no red, and there's a lot of green, and there's a lot of blue. Dark blue, notice, is no red, no, no green, and blue, but not blue all the way. Not blue like this is blue, whereas FF. So if we compare, there's dark blue, and there is light blue, or true blue, sort of, all right? Now, the good news is, again, that, you know, you could have dozed off for the past 10 minutes, and you can still use these color charts, all right, simply by cutting and pasting. Now, I'm actually not too bad today, you know. Um, you know, I'm wearing a black and white check shirt, and I have jeans on, so I'm matching pretty good today, all right? But you can't always count on that, you know, when I, when I dress myself, all right? Who knows what I'm liable to try to combine? Uh, stripes and plaids, that sort of thing. So, there's some people that just, you know, have an eye for that, all right? Then there's me, all right? Now the question is, is how do you develop web pages then? You know, look at how I dress. Do you want, are you going to trust me to picking the colors for a page? Uh, I don't know. 
Unfortunately, though, there's science to this, all right? And science is something you can apply systematically, and you can, you can say there are rules for what colors look good together based on the in relative intensity of the shades and all that, and there's complementary colors, and there's a whole lot of science going on here. So back in the old days, what they would actually have is they'd have a color wheel where you could turn it around and you could say, well, if you're going to use this shade of blue, this shade of red will go with it, for example. All right. Um, there are color wheels, online color wheels, that serve the same um, purpose. And again, um, it was mentioned that, that the one in Angel is broke. If you do something like HTML color scheme, okay, ah, gotcha. Here is our color wheel. And what you can do is you can pick, first of all, let, let's go through this. And interesting thing to me is that for a color page, it's almost impossible to read some of those things when projected on another thing, which, hmm, a little irony there, but that's okay. It is, it is somewhat visible when you, when you look at it here. Let's say I wanted to make uh, this page, uh, uh, this page about photography. And let's say, well, you know what, I take a lot of nature photos, so, you know, nature, I want to have it have a greenish look. All right. I can go and I can drag this over to the green part of the palette, and maybe I want a dark, darker green. All right, so I'll leave it there. And what this shows me are colors that are matched and that go together. Because not every green goes together, right? If you pick like a real yellowish green and a real bluish green, and, and it's not really going to look good. So what this does is this matches those colors and gives you a palette to choose from. Now, there's a couple different styles you can have. This one's called monochromatic. In other words, they're all different shades of green. You could also pick complementary. Again, you could play around to find something that, that looked. You could pick what's called a triad, a tetrad, analogic, and accented. <coughs> I'm going to keep it simple, and I'm going to go and stick with these shades of green. Now, it gives me four shades, all right? Remembering what we talked about last time, and remembering the thought of an all-you-can-eat buffet, chances are four shades are going to be enough for you, all right? Now, when you add to that, that in addition to those four shades, you could pretty much count on like white, black, shades of gray, you know. You're probably going to have enough colors right here for your page. Any more colors and the colors cease to be meaningful. All right. Remember, we use colors for a number of different reasons. One is to, to, to sort of evoke a feeling and to, to sort of match the mood of the content, you know. If in this case I was saying this, this, this site might be devoted to taking nature fo photographs or whatever, so green, yeah, that, that sounds like nature to me, right? All right. But we also use it like to emphasize things and, and to show things that are different. You know, we may show our navigation in different colors in our main content, or we may show our asides different than our main articles. So, um, you know, by choosing the colors, um, uh, choosing the colors shouldn't just be arbitrary. Uh, it, it, should, it, should, it should be meant to help the user, the viewer of the page, organize the content. So. If I click here for color list, I see there's a list of the colors with the hex codes. So what I could do is I could do something like this. Maybe I'll take this color here and I'll make it my page background color. So I'll go in my style sheet and I'll make the background of my page this. Remember to put the pound sign in front of it. Again, looking at this, I would hope that you understand at least enough level to know 
that this is a greenish color, right? Because the middle two digits are higher than either the red or the blue. All right, so we'll make the background of the page this color. We'll make the font the darkest to achieve the biggest contrast between the background Our header, make the background this. And let's make the text color. And the background of this, well, let's keep it simple and make it white. All right. Now, again, you know, just because it gave you five colors doesn't mean you have to use all five. Right? You use what makes sense. All right. And in this case, I'm creating a, a background color, a text color, and I'm setting the H, uh, I'm setting the header stuff and the H1s off a little different, so I'm using that. All right. So let's go and let's save this. And now view our page. All right. And we're moving in the direction where it doesn't just look like a big chunk of, of HTML. We're actually doing something with the way the page looks and making it um, a little more attractive. Now to be sure, there's a lot more stuff we can do and, and a lot of more stuff, more stuff that we, we will do. All right. Um, but, um, Going forward, you know, we're, we're uh, making some progress. Questions on what we've done so far? Go ahead. Ah, excellent question. Can you use something like an image? And the answer is you absolutely can. All right. Um, you need to be concerned about a couple things when you use uh, an image. First of all, it's going to make the download of the page slower. All right. Secondly, it is going to, um, you run the risk of it interfering with the text, uh, depending on the kind of image it is and, and so on and so forth. Um, there are some things that you can do. One thing you could do is you could sort of like wash out the uh, the image to make it look more like a watermark. Uh, that's one possibility. Um, let's take a look at doing that, though. All right, that's a good question. I was I was just looking at the clock and thinking, what am I going to talk about for the next ten minutes? And this is good a, good a thing as any. All right, so let's go and let's find an image. Pardon me. Uh, I don't know. I have the luxury of, if I'm sloppy, uh, I can just say, well, this is just an example. You know, when, when you do it yourself, go, go and make it look good. So I, I have that, that luxury. Uh, let's see. Let's go here. And I'm in Flickr. I'm going to search for camera. That's as good a suggestion as any. All right. And I'm going to go to advance search. And I'm going to say give me only those licensed Creative Commons. That way I know that I'm legally allowed to use this. And I'll even click find content is used commercially. Although in this case, I don't really have to. I'll do a search and it will show me all these wonderful things and Yeah, let's let's take this one. All right? And I'll go to 
view all sizes, and I'll pick the largest version, and I'll download it. All right. I'm going to go right now and copy this so that I can put a note on my page. image go. I think this is it. I'm going to copy it and put it on the desktop. And I'm going to go and rename this guy to BG. Just so that. Oops. Just so that it's easier to type in. And sure enough, this is the right picture. All right. So if I go here now and, and how to make it as part of the background, I can go and edit my CSS. All right. And one thing I could do is instead of a background color, I can say background URL. And put in the path to that image bg.jpg. And that says, hey, the, you, you asked, that, can you use something other than, uh, can you use an image instead of a color? Yes, you can. You can do that. Now, when I go and save this, there it is. Problem is, is now the text is very hard to read. All right? Now, I could do something like, let's try making the text white. Maybe that'll help me. All right. So I'll go on my style sheet, and I'll make the text white. And that doesn't look too bad for the portion of the text that's over the camera, because the camera is dark, but for this text. And that's one thing when you're using a, uh, a, a, uh, a background image. Um, usually they work the best if there's relatively like, low contrast in them. Because if there's big light sections and big dark sections, then what kind of text do you pick? Do you pick light text? Well, that won't show up good against the light portions. If you, you pick dark text, that doesn't show up good against the dark text. All right? Now... A few things that you could do, again, maybe, maybe we could find like, the right shade that would work with this. We could play around with different grays or whatever. Another thing we can do is we can actually go and edit the image. Let's see what we have on here. Not a lot. All right, let's go here and under tools, oh, brightness and contrast. I'm going to go and I'm going to like almost make this picture like a like a watermark. So I'm going to make it like that. What I did is I made it a lot brighter and I cut the contrast way down. So it's almost like a watermark now. And again, you can play with these settings to get them just the way you want. And now I'm going to go and save it. 
And now if we go look at this page, well now the white isn't a good choice. Let me go and go back to the original green and all right, that doesn't look bad now. All right. So the point is, is yes, you can do images. The problems associated with the images, uh, though, uh, are that it adds to the download of the page. Now, um, now this page is going to be downloaded, and, and it's going to take a while to download that. Um, the other thing, though, is, is just be sure that your, uh, your, your background doesn't interfere with uh, that. Um, now, background images, it's not obvious. Well, yeah, we can tell. Notice that it actually tiles the image. In other words, since there's more content, since the content available is bigger than the image, it actually creates a second copy of that. And you can prevent that through the, the, through the CSS rule. You can say not to repeat it. All right. The one thing that is often done, and we won't do it today, but we might do it next time. Uh, we'll definitely do it in one of the next several classes, is you can make like a little almost wallpaper behind it. All right. In other words, you could have your text sort of like in a window in the middle of your page and have like some sort of like decorative wallpaper almost, for lack of a better word, going around it. And we'll, th that's something that, that's commonly done. That has the advantage of, doing it that way has the advantage of, since you're only downloading a small image, and it gets tile going across and, and vertically, it doesn't like really add much to the download speed. Uh, and in addition, you know, you, you have it just sort of peeking around from the edges so it doesn't get into the way of the content. But we'll look at examples of that uh, next time. Or sometime soon. All right, questions? Yes? You have the uh, CSS as an external file. Does that affect uh, the URL, URL, whether it has to be relative? Yes, when you have the CSS as an external file, if it's not in the same folder as the the page, yeah, I believe it would. You'd give you'd give the path relative to the CSS file. So for that the background image, for example, within the CSS. Regular conventions for the relative. Yes. Yes. You can do that in HTML or, or CSS anytime you have a reference to a file, like even with an image. But uh, yeah, for that. And if I'm not mistaken, mistaken, yeah, it would be relative to the CSS. For starters, let's you know, if we keep everything in the same folder, then it's not an issue, all right. But for those of you that want to start breaking things down into different folders, it should be relative to the CSS. All right, we'll see you over in Lamb.